Good morning, everyone. Welcome, welcome to the Editorial Edge. I am Bhuvan Apurvaja, and I welcome you to this daily news analysis where we take a look at articles from the topical point of view, and not just from the point of view of understanding as articles itself. Okay. So on the agenda today, I have three topics for you: multiple MCQs, some that will actually test your conceptual understanding. The first one being echolocation. Okay. The Hindu came up with an article a couple of days ago, and it merits a much more deeper look. Than what uh, just the Hindu article had in itself. Okay, so we'll take a look at what echolocation is. What are the different types of species that use echolocation, and uh, well, what are the challenges? Because again, you will find that human beings have also come up with some sort of uh, mechanisms to uh, well, go ahead and disrupt echolocation. Okay, good morning, Koder. How are you? Welcome, welcome. The second one is going to be on India Greece. We had our Prime Minister who was on a visit to Greece. So we'll take a look at the historical linkages that India and Greece share, as well as what were the outcomes of the meeting that was held in Greece between the Indian Prime Minister and the Greece representative. And thereafter, the third topic is something to do with uh, what what was trending on social media previous evening, the last evening, in fact. Okay, we had super blue moon that was trending worldwide. So, well, from the geography point of view. The civil service aspirant needs to understand what a super blue moon is. How is it different from blue moon, and what is full moon, new moon, the waxing, waning, all of that. The NCRT is what we'll take a look at. Okay, so we have questions also for you today. So stand by. But before that, let me inform you that if you want to go ahead and uh, connect with me on uh, Instagram, well, this is where you go ahead and scan. Okay, uh, most of you have sent me answers for the MCQ that I had posted on my Telegram channel. Uh, I am in receipt of those, and you can expect a response on those answers by this evening. Okay, and for any such communication, well, this is my email ID. You can connect with me here too. And the PDF of this particular lecture, the entire bit will be available on my Inst sorry Telegram channel. Around noon is when I upload it. So go ahead, scan it, become a part of a strong community where we engage in a lot of well outcome-based learning. That's my key mantra here. Okay. All right. Let's take a look at the questions that I had from you from the previous class, where we discussed a host of topics. Crystal, good morning. So, first one: artificial intelligence includes technologies like machine learning, pattern recognition, big data, neural networks. Correct. Absolutely correct. Now, we discussed the relationship between artificial intelligence and data. Okay. And what we understood was that well, this distance is this uh, relationship is unidirectional. Okay. That data governs. How the artificial intelligence behaves, okay? So which means AI learns from data. Data cannot learn from AI. Obviously, the the sample set, the data set is going to model your uh, system on which the AI is based. Which means inaccuracies in the data will lead to inaccuracies in the interpretation by the AI system, okay? And so the self correction of inaccuracies is the big debate. For example, if there is a host of number of articles. Around a certain topic, which contain a certain bit of misinformation. Okay, now when you go ahead and predict a, a system based on AI, it is going to factor in these particular articles and then come up with its own version. Which means, if there is inaccuracy in the preliminary data set, the interpretation of that is going to be flawed too. Okay, so inaccuracies in data will right now cannot be corrected by AI, which is one of the primary problems that arises out of AI systems. Okay, especially when it consider the student friendly Chat GPT, you know, uh, it's most advised that you go ahead and read the primary article rather than go ahead and use Chat GPT in terms of knowledge building. Okay, so identify the incorrect statements. Well, C and D are the incorrect statements here. Okay, now uh, what I found was many of you do not read the questions properly. Okay, most of you have gone ahead and given me the correct statements answer. And this is a uh, this is a theme that is uh, common to say most kinds of aspirants. So once again, here is a suggestion: read the question first, figure out what it is asking you, whether it is correct statements, incorrect statements, what exactly is the big deal there? Okay, take your time to understand and then interpret and then answer. Okay, which of the following are above are initiatives, interventions in AI by India? Well, here is the answer. All of them are. Okay, the national AI strategy, MyGov Corona Help Desk Chatbot, which was launched during the coronavirus pandemic, Race 2020, and the WebHub Summit. All of them to do with India's participation or policy interventions in the field of artificial intelligence. Okay, we'll take a look at the sixth C state, the C question that I have for you. 
so element of justice preamble obviously does article 39 a legal aid directly talks about justice article 14 and 21 obviously talk about justice okay ashok good morning abhiram good morning good morning so which of the above comprise element of justice well again all of them okay this is preliminary ncrt that has been asked here which of the above are correctly matched? Now, these are to do with Tele Law 2.0, which we had discussed in the last class, where we discussed that, well, the Common Service Center, the CSEs become a nodal point when it comes to, say, accessing Tele Law. Okay. For any problems related to the Tele Law system or services, CSC, the Common Service Centers, become your nodal point. Okay. So, in that case, what you're understanding is that Nyay Bandhu has nothing to do with the Common Service Center. Whereas Tele Law is to do with reaching the unreached and well, this is again incorrect, which means A is the only correct answer here. And finally, a PYQ that I had from you for NALSA, the National Legal Services Authority. Well, its objective is to provide free and competent legal services to those who cannot afford, say, going ahead and paying for a hefty, a hefty fee for a big lawyer. Okay, so they are given free legal aid and advice and this is based on the basis of equal opportunity. And it does have a state legal service authority where it goes ahead and engages in legal awareness programs, outreach, communication, as well as partnership. So as to make sure that access to legal aid is uh, uh, free, fair and equitable across the country. Okay. So the correct statements here being both, both of the statements being correct. Here. Okay. So let's look at uh, the individuals who have answered correctly for me. Now you'll see a many uh, repeat names here. Ulfat, Karuna, Tanu, Indian Superpower. Crystal Coder, Pooja, Mandeep, Ayush, Aditya, Rahul and Akshay. Thank you so much for your participation. However, what I've observed is some of you have answered one or two questions incorrectly and that is primarily to do with the fact that you did not recognize whether you were asked to identify the correct statement or the incorrect statement. So going forward, try and give at least 30 more seconds to a particular question just to figure out what the question is asking you. And to the rest, go ahead. I have a set of say seven, eight questions today. Engage with it. Okay. You will see it will lead to an incremental and finally an exponential increase in the way you go ahead and analyze news and come up with the ways and means to answer questions. Okay. All right. Let's jump into the first topic I have for you today. Ecolocation, an article from the Hindu. Okay. So, firstly, what is ecolocation? What you're looking at is that a particular prey, a particular predator, a, a, someone who is high up in the food chain, that particular predator is going to emit sound waves. Now, the sound waves so emitted, once they start to travel through the medium, then they come across the predator, the prey in fact. Okay, here is your predator, here is your prey. So, this direction of propagation of sound waves and thereafter the reflection, the subsequent reflection of the sound waves is equilocation. Essentially, using echo to go ahead and understand the location of the prey. Okay, you find many such uh, species, animals that have this particular uh, method. So, it's not just limited to bats. You find uh, dolphins, certain types of whales, porpoises. You have certain mammals also that go ahead and engage with it. Certain rodents, even certain birds that have, uh, say, this particular method that they use to go ahead and hunt. Okay, so we'll understand this first. Bats, they emit a high frequency call. Now, that is dispersed through the atmosphere. They, then it reflects off the objects, thus includes the prey also. Now, once this happens, as the call travels away from the bat, it spreads. So, this particular point, you are finding that the sound waves are emanating in all directions and thus it gets an entire sonar range of its entire area of scanning. Once it has all the reflected waves that comes back to it, it is able to visually go ahead and map this whole area that is in front of it. You will be surprised to know that it can go ahead and even detect as fine as hair strands, okay, through use of echolocation. So, we see that the call reflects off the both and travels back to the bat and thus you go ahead and it finds out that it looks at valuable information about the area that is in front of it. Now, what are the other species that go ahead and use this? Number two, what you are looking at is dolphins and whales that use this exclusively and um, extensively in the oceans. Dolphins use this because again you they operate in say muddy waters. Okay. So visually they are not going to be going and so confirming what is in front of them, which is why echolocation is used there too. 
you find that they make certain clicking sounds. Okay, certain clicking sounds are made by them. Again, high frequency sounds originate from a certain point, spread out through the surface of the sea. Go ahead, scan the whole area, give it all the information that it needs based on the reflected waves. Okay, so dolphins and waves, high pitched clicking sound underwater objects, similar to shouting and listening for echoes. Thereafter, you find that how does it do it? Made by squeezing air through nasal passages near the blowhole. Now, you realize that whales have blowholes right at the top of their head, if you can call it the head, okay, where they go ahead and release water. That is also used to release these high frequency clicking sounds, eventually going ahead and using echolocation as a method of scanning the whole area that is in front of it. Okay. So, the things that it can figure out, distance, direction, speed, density and size. All information that you need, okay, in so far as scanning that particular area, giving it all the information, okay. This is used again by dolphins, waves and bats and the rest of the species that I have for you. So, we have discussed bats, whales and dolphins. You are also looking at porpoises recently. We discussed and used on a particular type of porpoise, okay, that was uh, found in the Gulf of Mexico. Can someone let me know what was it? All right. You are looking at oil birds. Now, again, avian species to South America. Swiftlets, these are all insect eaters, by the way. Primary, most of them are insect eaters, which is why you find that they go ahead and use this eco location to figure out the exact location of their prey. Okay. Dormis, it is a rodent. You are again looking at shrews, tenrex, all of them using eco location as a method of understanding their. Uh, area and subsequently catching their prey. That's the whole point of it. Okay. So, let's look at the questions that I have for you now. First one. Now, what I expect is go ahead, take a look at the questions, give it some time, answer the questions in a linear format. I have questions from A to G, I believe. Look at them, answer them in the YouTube comment box. All right. The correct answers get figured tomorrow morning in my MCQ master's slide. All right. Engage with it you can be rest assured that you will benefit out of this exercise. So, number one, radio waves, microwaves, electromagnetic waves or none of the above. What is the particular type of wave that is used during echolocation? Statement B, question B in fact. Statement one, speed of sound is maximum in solids and minimum in gases. So, what we do know is the 334 meter per second, I believe, is the speed of sound. Now, you are going to tell me how does sound behave in different medium. That's the whole point of this question, that you should be able to figure out that sound in solids, liquids and gas, that is matter, as well as sound in vacuum behave completely differently. All right. So, you're going to go ahead and answer this question for me. Statement B, with increase in temperature of medium, how is sound expected to behave? Will the speed of sound increase or decrease? Statement C, with increase in density of medium, well, how does sound behave? So, essentially what you're looking at is the entire knowledge of speed of sound vis-a-vis -vis the medium it operates in. Again, a basic NCRT level question, nothing uh, that is again extraordinary that is asked about it. However, you should be aware of how sound operates in different medium that is expected out of a civil service aspirant. So, you go ahead and identify, bear in mind the incorrect questions. Okay. Not the correct ones. Go ahead and let me know the incorrect questions for this. This is question B for you. And finally, you are going to identify monotremes. Now, what are monotremes? Well, these are mammals that can lay eggs. Okay. Mammals that can lay eggs. So, go ahead. Identify which are the monotremes here. All right. Once again, options. Platypus, echidna, rodents and dolphins. You let me know the answers in the chat box, in the comment box, in fact. All right, this closes tomorrow, by the way, 31st of August, this evening itself. So, well, the time is limited. Unfortunately, this should be BA live, okay, not BB live. Go ahead, sign up for this, okay. You will see, if you haven't, say, yet started your preparations for next year, here is a 30-second mantra on why you should have started by now. You do not have enough time to actually cover the entire syllabus to the level that is expected unless and until you start now. If you are doing it your own way, good. My best wishes are with you. If you need a bit of guidance and hand-holding, here is 
an option. Go ahead to studyiq.com. Look at the course deliverables. All right. Identify the key faculty. You will understand that it is being offered in three languages, Hindi, English and bilingual. And this entirely covers the entire spectrum of prelims, plus means, plus interview. The entire syllabus of it. Okay. This is a comprehensive uh, one point, one point uh, uh, program that any student will benefit out of, again, if they work in coordination and in harmony with uh, the goals that are laid out in so far as the prelims to interview initiative is concerned. Okay, this is closing this evening. Go ahead, you'll find the uh, sign-up link in the description box. When you're going to the payments page, use the code B-A-L-I-V-E because what does that do? Well, it assures you a substantial discount. Okay, what you're going to find is you're going to get it at what? 27,999. Okay, Raksha Bandhan gift, Raksha Bandhan initiative. Make the best use of it. Okay, uh, the orientation class is this evening 6 p.m. And I hope many of you will consider joining the prelims to interview initiative. Good morning, Bulbul, Abiram. Thank you. Abhishek and Vijaya. Hmm, EM waves or microwave? Really? Think of it. Eco location has to do with what kind of waves? Again, go ahead and have a look at the slide. You will find it in the uh, Telegram channel at noon. All right. The second topic, India and Greece. So we found that uh, the recent visit by Prime Minister Srinendra Modi to Greece and you found that uh, the outcomes of the entire meeting, yes, very, very relevant in so far as India's engagement with Greece because again, it wasn't the first time in 40 years that an Indian Prime Minister made an official visit to Greece. So, well, firstly, where is it located? Well, off the coast of Mediterranean Sea. All right, this is where you're going to find it. Off the coast of Mediterranean, bordered by the countries Albania, Macedonia, Bulgaria and Turkey. Couple of seas that you need to go ahead and understand from the mapping perspective, Aegean Sea, okay, Adriatic Sea. All of these are important touch points that you go ahead and need to have a look. So, well, if you haven't so far, get yourself a good map firstly and look at these particular seas. Identify where are they located, what are the states, what is it, is it a marginal sea? Of course, it's a marginal sea. Go ahead and understand the key facets of these particular seas, okay? Couple of names that I have marked for you, Asian Sea, Adriatic Sea, Ionian Sea and obviously Mediterranean Sea which is the focus of our attention, okay? So, well, what is Greece? We have obviously heard of, say, museum, you know, they owe their origin to Greece, for example. Not included in the slide, but here is one more such uh, thing that is Greece credited with, okay? It's called the birthplace of, uh, well, Western civilization, philosophy, arts, all of these high thoughts originated from Greece, you know? So, you have what? The oldest civilizations in the world, one of the oldest, obviously, considered the cradle of Western civilization. And Greece is credited with a lot of things that still continue to this date. Okay. For example, democracy, obviously, philosophy, Olympics, museum, theatre, all of this have uh, seen their origin in Greece in some form, manner or the other. For example, museum, you know, that place used to be essentially a place where all these philosophers and intellectuals would come and ruminate and then say come up with solutions and ideas. Eventually, that hallowed sacrosanct place became a place where, say, artifacts were stored and collected for interpretation. Thereafter, eventually, that translate that whole concept translated into what we know as museums today. Okay. So, Greece is obviously known for a lot of things. I have listed down a few of them here. Highest mountain, Mount Olympus. Famous, again, not, say, from the just mythological point of view. But again, it's, it's the highest mountain that you found, uh, find in Greece. And obviously, Pindus and Taurus Mountains are the major mountain ranges that you find in Greece. Now, let's go ahead and understand the historical linkages. How is India and Greece connected? Well, it all began 2500 years ago. Okay. You will find that, say, not just in art, in culture. For example, the Gandhara School of Art. You have all heard and read about it in your arts and art and culture book. Yes, it had Hellenistic origins. It drew with inspiration from Hellenistic art and architecture, which means Hellenistic is obviously going to refer to Greece. Okay. So, let's understand it in a sequence. First, Alexander the Great came up till almost the Indus River, couldn't uh, go ahead past it. Okay. So, well, first instance that India saw uh, Greece, uh, uh, you know, so far as interlinkage is concerned. Okay. A meeting point was concerned. Thereafter, diplomatic, trade, cultural relations all well, gained prominence and were mentioned in Ashoka's edicts. Okay. 
Bulbul, yes, you're correct. Mostly political thinkers. That was the point of uh, museums. Nagesh, good morning. Welcome, welcome. You also found trading between Mauryan kings and Greece. Can someone let me know which king am I referring to here? Very quickly, if you're watching this live, let me know. You also find Chanakya, who records in Arthashastra about the court of Megasthenes. And then finally, Gandhara art, which I just mentioned, drew from Hellenistic art and culture. Okay. So, what, the, what, the, what kind of, uh, say, school of uh, Buddhism did uh, uh, Gandhara school of art talk about? Mahayana Buddhism or Hinayana Buddhism? That's a question that I have for you today. Okay, we'll, we'll see that. So, you find Gandhara art, which again drew from Hellenistic art and culture, flourished in the region of present-day Pakistan and Afghanistan, and well, a marriage of Indian and Greek influences. Okay, so let's look at the next. So now that you have looked at the historical linkages, now what's the outcome of the meeting? The first by an Indian Prime Minister in close to 40 years. Okay. So number one, what you find is the relationship has been upgraded to a strategic partnership. One of these days, we are going to do a class on understanding these different partnerships that come up in international relations. For example, a strategic partnership, a comprehensive strategic partnership. What are the different stages of these kind of marriages that come, alliances that develop between nations. Okay? In Greece's case, they are a strategic partner of India now. And the key aims, doubling trade by 2030, Enhancing defense and security collaboration, you will find that in your course 23 is where Indian Air Force will be going and participating in your course, again India and Greece. You are also finding shared challenges of say climate, environment and sustainability. Okay, the recommitment to say Paris goals, the SDGs, Agenda 2030, all of them being reaffirmed during the visit. Now more importantly what you find is that the two nations talk about UNCLOS in the outcome document, saying that well, a free, fair and accessible maritime routes is required and desired, say in the Indo-Pacific and the Mediterranean Sea. Now you will understand, say that the Indo-Pacific does have some key areas of conflicts when it comes to the application of UNCLOS, South China Sea, for example. Okay. So once again, this pointing to the fact that they are standing up together and collectively as uh, to this say, proposed hegemony. You know, some may call it the hegemony of the seas that is being imposed by China. So therein is the interpretation that once again, reaffirming the key tenets of the United Nations Convention on Law of the Seas. Okay. And what more importantly is the Mobility and Migration Partnership Agreement, the MMPA. Now from the MCQ perspective, I suggest you make a note. Okay. Why, why am I telling you this? First, for, for example, recently, the uh, European Union came up with a certain sort of say, carbon tax. Okay. So these particular mechanisms that are put by say, nations or between bilateral nations, between uh, during bilateral visits, these kind of memorandums of understanding the names that are given to them are very important to be identified and quickly correlated with the region that they are uh, say uh, formed from. Okay. So again, one more question, which tax am I referring to when I talk about say European Union's new carbon tax? What is the name of that particular taxing mechanism? You will let me know in the chat. Consider that question number H. Okay. Go ahead and identify. So, for example, MMPA is to do with, say, free movement of workflows between India and Greece. Similarly, this particular tax mechanism that had been uh, recently, in fact, uh, it's going to be applicable from October the 1st, just a month from now, okay, by the European Union has come in from immense criticism because, again, it say, ignores the carbon capabilities of developing nations. Okay. So it also goes, uh, goes ahead and one of the primary criticisms of this tax that is to be imposed by the European Union is that it does not talk about technology and the access to technology in say Western nations and non-Western nations. So go ahead, identify both of these for me. All right, let's look at this question that I have for you guys. Question number one, geography, mapping. Strait of Gibraltar connects what to what? Atlantic to Mediterranean. Strait of Gibraltar, does it separate the Iberian Peninsula? Go ahead. If you do not know what the Iberian Peninsula is, quickly open your map. Quickly open your map and tell me what comprise the uh, Iberian Peninsula. And does the Strait of Gibraltar separate Iberian Peninsula from Morocco? And is the Strait of Gibraltar currently not open 
is it not open or is it open for navigation? You shall go ahead, identify which are the incorrect statements. Bear in mind, the incorrect statements have been asked here. Okay, leave the answer for me in the comment box. Statement E. Now, I told you that Olympics is a gift of Greece to the world. Okay, and say if you get a question about Olympics in the mains. Okay, obviously you will talk about say Olympics being a huge people to people connect platform and it fosters all that it stands for faster, stronger and higher and all of that. Okay, fine. But one of the primary criticisms of Olympics, because again you have to play the devil's advocate when you are a civil service aspirant. So one of the primary criticisms is that is it equitable? Is it really inclusive? Okay, because once you find that where the Olympics have been held across the years, well, that will ask you, that will uh, prop up a few questions for you. So go ahead, this is what my question is about today. Greece has hosted the Summer Olympics only twice. Which country has held the Olympics the maximum number of time? Is it US? Is it Greece itself? Go ahead and find that out for me. And no country in Africa has ever hosted the Summer Olympics. True or false? You will identify the incorrect statements for me. Finally, question number F, Gandhara art that we just discussed right now. Good morning, Abhi Vlogs. How are you? How are you? Welcome, welcome. So, Gandhara art, is it closely associated with Mahayana Buddhism or is it Hinayana Buddhism? If it is with Mahayana, what does it talk about? If it is with Hinayana, what does it talk about? Okay. The main theme of Gandhara art was Lord Buddha and Bodhisattvas. Herein is your hint for statement one. Again, anyone who's done their art and culture, well, this question they can solve even in their sleep. Okay, here is a major hint for you to solve question statement one. And the Bamiyan Buddha statues, and I'm using the word war because, well, they have been unfortunately destroyed by terrorists, okay, extremists, terrorists, whichever way. Bamiyan Buddha statues were an example of Gandhara school of art. Go ahead, identify the incorrect statements once again, okay. This will again ask you to go ahead and read up a bit, a 10 minute read. But what you'll understand is that you will straight away be able to link it to India, Greece relations and the whole point of Gandhara art being influenced by the Hellenistic art and culture and the traditions of Greece. Okay, so that's question F for you. All right, before I move on to my third topic for the day, which we are going to discuss the super blue moon that was trending last evening. What I'm going to ask you is to leave me a like if you are liking this discussion. All right, uh, and leave me a comment if you have any specific feedback. If there's something that else, uh, something else that you would like me to do, all right, go ahead and let me know of that too in the comment box. It'll be greatly appreciated. Okay. And again, if you're liking this, go ahead and share this with your friends too. Where is all this information coming from? Uh, well, this information is coming from newspapers, from articles, from various portals, all that collated in a topical manner so that a student can take the maximum benefit out of the learning of a particular topic is uh, the whole point of uh, this uh, brief 30 to 40, 50 minute session that we have every morning. Okay, Gai Welcome, by the way. All right. Okay. This is my Instagram handle, by the way. Go ahead and connect with me if you have any particular doubts related to what we have discussed today. All right. Let's look at Super Blue Moon. Trending on Twitter yesterday. Okay. So first understand Moon. Now, straight away what you have to understand is that in terms of, say, the Earth and the Moon, we do have and we have knowledge that it is an elliptical well, orbit. It's not a circular orbit, which means that its circumference is not going to be, and its point, its distance from Earth is not going to be constant. Okay. So you do know of two particular terms that are frequently used insofar as the distance between Earth and Moon is concerned. Okay. Perigee and apogee frequently used. Perigee is when it is at its nearest, when both Earth and the moon are closest to each other and apogee is when they are at the farthest. Very quickly let me know which of the, these will be an perigee and an apogee. I have marked A and B for you. Go ahead and quickly identify them because then you are going to quickly understand what the blue moon is about and what the full moon is about. Okay. Let me know very quickly which of these will be a perigee A or B. Which one of that will be an apogee A or B. Okay. Now that you have go, gone ahead and say, identified the direction of the orbit of the moon, the orbital plane you can consider, 
Now what you know is new moon and full moon. This particular waxing and waning of the moon that we understand. Okay. Say at times Amavasya in Hindi and uh, Purnima in Hindi again. So Amavasya is essentially new moon and Purnima is full moon. Okay. So a lunar cycle. Now a lunar cycle, you and I my friends, we both know, runs for say 29.5 days roughly on an average. Okay. Now you know that uh, a normal Gregorian calendar has say 30, 31 days. What happens eventually? that this dif difference that is there eventually starts collating, compounding month after month after month. And so at a point comes when you would expect say four types of, uh, say these movement happening more number of times than the usual number of times. Okay. So we'll understand now point by point. Now that you have understood the basics, let's go for it. Consequently, when the moon re reaches its closest point to earth, perigee, Super moon. Straight away what your understanding is that super moon is essentially to do with perigee plus a full moon. The moment this criteria is met that it is at its closest whereas in the lunar cycle it's the point of full moon you're going to find that the moon is going to be 14% brighter in the sky. Now sometimes people may say that well the moon looks blue. Okay. So essentially, blue moon has got nothing to do with the color. Mount Krakatoa, for example, erupted. With it came out lots of volcanic ash, dust. What you found was that it was able to scatter red light. For a large number of years, in fact, for many number of years after Krakatoa erupted, what you found was that the moon visually looked blue because of the presence of these fine particles in the atmosphere. That the light was getting scattered, which means the appearance of the moon was looking blue. However, insofar as blue moon is to be considered, it isn't blue because it is blue. It is blue because the light that is getting scattered is red, which is why we are getting blue light in our eyesight. Take it. So due to this reduced distance between the earth and the moonar, the lunar body appears larger, fuller and brighter. So thus what you find, blue moon, when the two full moons occur within a single month, please understand, no relation to the moon's color. It has absolute relation to do with scattering of light, but nothing to do with the color of the moon itself. Now, the scattering could be due to a host of reasons. It could be due to pollution. It could be due to volcanic eruption. All you need are these fine particles of the right diameter for the light to get scattered and the appearance to look, uh, to look blue of sorts. Okay. So, super blue moon where both phenomena are coinciding, which can only happen roughly once in a decade. In fact, the next uh, blue moon is the super blue moon is supposed to be in 2037. Okay. So that's the whole point of it. That you're looking at this convergence of both these phenomena. Okay. And once that happens, you find that the moon looks bluer, but visually bluer, bigger, much more brighter. And that is called a super blue moon, which was trending last evening. So let's look at it in the figure wise that I have for you. Here is perigee and apogee. At perigee, you have just understood that the moon is closest to the earth, which is why you find that it is close to up to 14% larger visually. Okay. And at Apogee, the moon is furthest in its orbit and thus it appears 14% smaller and thus consequently dimmer too. Okay. Now you find that this waxing and waning, very, very key to understand that waning happens when you're going from say full moon to new moon. Whereas waxing is the opposite way. Please understand this key terms. When you have to understand, say, what waxing is, what waning is. Okay. Now that you have understood, say, this lunar cycle and say how a blue moon operates and how is it different from super, super blue moon, let's go ahead quickly and look at the questions that I have for you. First question, phase from new moon to full moon is called as waning. And second question, the phase from full moon to new moon is called as waxing. You will go ahead and identify which of the statements above are correct. All right. Well, uh, that those are your questions, by the way. I've given you G, questions till G, but I have uh, included one more question. So consider that as H. Answer the questions for me in the comment box. If you have any particular doubts that you would like me to address for you, I'm available in my email ID, but ideally, I would like you to connect with me on Instagram. It's easier for me. All right. And with that, my dear friends, my dear uh, audience, we come to the end of this particular 
editorial edge for today. What you're going to do is leave the questions, the answers for me in the comment box, as well as access the PDF that I have for you on this Telegram channel. I will be uploading it at 12 today. And I hope you have a productive day. Go ahead and answer the questions for me. Any comment that you have for me, leave it in the comment box. Leave me a like if you understood the topics that are very important for you. You will see it's a lot of geography oriented topics we have done today. One IR oriented. And in the coming days, uh, a lot of topics will be to do with, say, a deep dive into particular topics. Okay. For example, in the very beginning, we had started with deep dives. Now we have oriented ourselves a little bit towards prelims. In the coming days, it will be a lot of, say, mains understanding plus prelims uh, uh, related understanding. Okay. Thanks, guys, for joining. Have a wonderful, productive day. Till I see you tomorrow morning, 6.30 a.m. at Study IQIS, on Study IQIS. Uh, bye and see you. Thanks.